Amen. Well, we started our time last week looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, there we saw that there were some divisions within the body of believers. We saw that the Apostle Paul urged the followers of Jesus to agree on how the Spirit works among them. The conflict centered on this. The conflict centered on whom they preferred to preach and to teach. Who they felt they were of is how they approached it. Some leaned towards the Apostle Paul. Some leaned towards Apollo. Some said that they were of Jesus and so on. And we didn't get to it last week, um, but Paul's question in verse 13 says this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? That's the question he posed to the body who were disagreeing about who they were of. Now, Paul is likely addressing a few problems that were taking place. But the number one that we should take away from that response is that there is no person that should ever be escalated to the point where they elevate them on the same level as Christ. And I'll tell you, it's easy to do that, and I'll, I'll share a personal example uh, here in a little while. But there's none that should be elevated that high. The other thing this verse hints at is the fact that Christ is one with His body. Let me say that again. Christ is one with His body. And with this illustration of the church being Christ's body, we've heard that, we hear that all the time, we, we read of that in Scripture, uh, there should be no reason for a body to live in disunity. Now, it's an anatomical and biological impossibility for you to be sitting here this morning in Grace Free, at Grace Free Will Baptist Church, worshiping, worshiping Jesus, hopefully, uh, while at the same time your hands and your feet are elsewhere working. Now, I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it just makes no physical sense. Now, I figured there would be some, <clears throat> Jeremy, that would try to be funny and say, oh, well, you can have a limb that's been put somewhere else. Well, guess what? If that limb is somewhere else, you've had an amputation, something like that, your body is now not unified together, that portion, that extremity is now dead and is no longer useful to you. No, the one whole body that serves a purpose that is all driving for the same thing is together. And much like your physical body, right here this morning is in one place at one time sitting here in a pew. The body of Christ should be the same. Maybe not in each other's physical presence, but all striving and working towards one thing, one mission. And that is to grow closer to God and to point people to Jesus. Now, disputes and tension limit any relationship that you and I have. It just does. Especially within the church. Uh, I know I've asked several times before, uh, I don't think I have a ton of basketball fans in here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this a different way. Has anybody ever heard of Kobe Bryant? Just raise your hands. We do a lot of hand raising this morning. Great. Has anybody ever heard of Shaquille O'Neal? Yes, absolutely. Odds are these are household names. You probably have heard of them. Now, both were considered phenomenal athletes during their prime when they played in the NBA. And in the early 2000s, they were both members of the, the Los Angeles Lakers. However, it can be argued that they never really reached their, few, uh, their full potential rather, uh, as, as a team, as, as a cohesive unit, during Kobe and, and Shaquille O'Neal's tenure with the Lakers. Now, it surely wasn't because of lack of talent between these two guys, and it, it wasn't over uh, disputes about money that caused problems. It really came down to a difference or a clashing of personalities, and both having the desire to be the best, not only on their team, but in the game. Nevertheless, neither one of them wanted to concede to the other, so they battled each other. Uh, they tried to win against each other while also trying to defeat their opponents. When you do that, you rarely reach your full potential. And their relationship, both on and off the court, uh, uh, 
bubbled over. It, 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 the disagreements on who was the team leader, uh, the disagreements on who should have the ball more, the disagreements on who should be featured more in front of the camera and in the media, well, that caused conflicts amongst the team. Now, granted, the team was still successful. They won championships while both men were still playing there. But the, the tensions got to a boiling point, and it got so bad that Shaquille O'Neal ended up leaving the team. All because, when you boil it down and both men said this, all because of a clash of personality. Who knows what could have been for the Los Angeles Lakers if they were being cohesive, if they were both working together instead of trying to work against each other. But they allowed disunity to impede progress. If you have your Bibles, do me a favor. Join me in Romans chapter 14 again this week as we continue our series in Romans. And uh, we'll be finishing chapter 14. Uh, and uh, before we read God's word, let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer once more to ask him to bless our time together. Father God, uh, I lift up praises and thankfulness to you this morning for the many blessings that are too numerous to name at this point. But Father, I'm thankful for your graciousness and your mercy. Father, I'm thankful for those who have come out this morning to worship you. And I just pray this morning as we read your word, uh, Father, uh, that we do so with an attentive mind, an open heart, and that we are ready to receive what you would have us to know. Father, I recognize that as I read this word, that I am in no position to persuade or to lead uh, people one way or another. But Father, I know that when your word is read, that lives change, that hearts are revived, and that people are one to the Lord. I pray for any or all of those things to happen here this morning. I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray these things. Amen. So we're going to pick back up in Romans chapter 14. Uh, verse 14. Here's what God's Word tells us. It says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. The first point we can get from these verses here in the latter half of Romans chapter 14 is that Christians should care about their reputation. I'll say that again. Christians should care about their reputation. Now look, I, I, I've said it many a times. Uh, I, I've thought it certainly more than I've said it. And I'd venture to guess that some of you may even have shared the same sentiment that I'm about to say. I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what people think. It's a very common thought. It's a very common philosophy. Uh, however, these verses directly contradict that line of thinking. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, then Paul is challenging that very thought process. Why should you care what others think as a Christian? Why would it matter? What does it matter in terms of eternity what people think about you? For starters, God's Word tells us that a good name, which is another way to say a good reputation, is something that you and I as Christians should desire, we should strive for. Just so you know I'm not lying to you or that I'm somehow uh, embellishing God's Word, I'll tell you exactly where it says. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs number 22 verse 1. God's word says a good name is better to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver or gold. Let me ask you a question this morning. I've asked you to do this a few times over the past couple of years, but we're, I'm going to say it one more time. If you were to sit just for a moment and think to yourself and take an inventory of everything you possess, everything that you have, everything you own, everything that you can grasp and even the intangible that you still have control over. Take an inventory right now. Think of every bit of money you have in your wallet or your purse or that you can access with a debit card that's stored somewhere in a bank, hopefully. 
Think of your home. Think of your vehicle. Think of any valuables you may have. None of that is comparable to a good reputation. Now, this is not, I have no scriptural backing for this. I'm just going to tell you my thought here. I think there's a few things that we have and we possess that are more important than anything else. We have our soul in determining where it will go in eternity. That's the most valuable commodity we own. Secondly, is our relationship with God, which dictates it really is just uh, one and two are, are uh, intermingled. Secondly, it's our relationships with our family, with each other. But thirdly, I would say is our reputation. That is the third most valuable thing you possess this morning. You can replace, I can replace money. They're making $15, $16 an hour at Sheets right now. We can replace money. If your house burns down, well, I'm pretty sure you can find shelter elsewhere. No, it might not be to your liking, but you will still find a place where you are shielded from the elements. If your car breaks down, I'm sure you could find a ride or find another car. Maybe you could borrow one or buy another one. If you can't do that, maybe you can ride your riding lawnmower around. And before you make fun of me or smile at me, there's a guy who does it right up the street all the time. And hey, say you don't have a lot more one you think that would travel from place to place. Hey, maybe you can get a horse. And if you don't have a horse, maybe you can borrow one. And you know what? Maybe if you don't have a horse, can't borrow a horse, don't have a lot more, can't get another car, hey, we can just walk to get from point A to point B or maybe ask for a ride. Look, what I'm saying is if we need to get from one place to another, we can replace that car. You and I can take all our prized possessions, put it in a single place, pour gasoline on it and burn it down. And even though some of those things may be sentimental and only one of a kind, realistically, they can be replaced. New memories can be formed. But what is not replaceable, and what the Christian should take seriously, what is not replaceable is what others think of you, what others think of me. Now don't get the wrong idea about what I'm saying. Uh, you and I are not protecting our reputation, or Paul is not calling us to be concerned with our reputation as an exercise of vanity. Uh, it's not so that you and I can be looked at as super Christian. The smartest one in the room, the most holy, the one that everybody looks up to. It's not what he's driving at here with these verses. Instead, you are doing things that are looked upon favorable in something, or as favorable, in something that can be glorified. But not for your glory, and not for my glory, but for the glory of our Father who is in heaven. We see in verse 15, Paul is reaffirming that you and I have been given freedom to live how we want to live without the need to observe the law. In particular, the debate is about Mosaic law. We have been given the liberty to live how we see fit. That was one of the issues we discussed last week and, and, and was where certain Jews um, thought that others needed to uh, observe a restricted diet. But Paul is saying is that that freedom which you and I possess, uh, possess only because of the Lord Jesus Christ should not be used as a way to dishonor another. Let me say that again. The freedom that you and I have been given should never be used to dishonor another. It should not be used in any way to inflict harm on a fellow brother or sister in Christ. In fact, Paul would go on to say that we should not use our freedom in any manner that causes us to not walk according to love. In Romans chapter 14, we know that they're good the quote-unquote good, don't turn your good into evil is what I'm referring to here. We know that their good was to live free so they didn't have to observe a special diet. They didn't have to keep some days more holier than others. All those things were done away with because of the shedding of Christ's blood. He had fulfilled every law perfectly. They felt liberated because Jesus had set them free from all of those things. 
But Paul was saying that if liberty is exercised in a way that causes pain or hurt to a weaker brother or sister in Christ, well then, it's something that you and I should not do. Because if we do this, then it intentionally, or rather if we do this intentionally, then it becomes evil. And it's viewed so as such. Now look. I'm saying we should protect our reputations. I'm saying we should live in a way that doesn't offend each other, right? We should live in a way where we should consider those who are weaker in the faith and the shortcomings and the misunderstandings that they have. But I do realize that there are some things that would just be unpreventable. People will disagree. It happens. I, as a lot of you know... um, have been accused of intentionally inflicting harm on someone else. For some, it's an elephant in the room. For me, it's not. It's quite simple, really, when you dig down to what took place. I've done my best to reconcile. I've asked for forgiveness in the presence of witnesses that are here. Um, Yet, my motives have still been scrutinized, and I would dare to say my reputation has been questioned even by some in this room. There are some things that are just unpreventable. And no matter how much you try to do to protect your reputation, sometimes it still doesn't work out so much. And I only share this with you because you may have had a similar situation that you just can't get over. Something in the past that someone holds against you that you just can't get, it just weighs you down. Maybe you're still dealing with that situation now. Maybe you will have a similar situation in the future. In this life, this side of eternity, there are just some things that won't be resolved. But that doesn't give us the right to live any way, shape, or form to go about offending one another continuously. Paul is telling us that we should consider the weaker brother or sister in Christ. Because look, we can't control everybody's opinions, we can't control the masses, but here's what we can control, Christian. We can control ourselves. How we react and how we live. Paul is telling us to do everything within our power to use our freedom in Christ to live the way that guards against a bad reputation. And we do that by staying faithful to God. Once again, I'm going I'm I'm to show you so you know I'm not just saying this. We do this by following the book of Proverbs, the third proverb, verses 3 and 4, which says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. I'm going to say that again. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the tablet of thine heart, so thou shalt find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Look, you may say right now, well, there's some people who don't like me. That's okay. You're not going to be everybody's best friend. But that doesn't give us carte blanche to just live in any sort of way, to intentionally do things that I know is going to make others mad. It just doesn't. Paul is telling us to consider our reputation. So the, the Christian should strive for a good reputation. Well, then here's my question. I said this during Sunday school. Sometimes I'm like a three-year-old, and the only word I think I know is why. Why is that important? What's the reason for trying to keep that good reputation? That's the second point this morning. Going back to God's word. Romans chapter 14, picking back up in verse 17. Here's what God's word says. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. The reason that you and I as followers of Jesus Christ should strive for a good reputation is that our sights should be set on something greater than what's going on right now. One of the most valuable pieces of advice I ever got, and it didn't have any spiritual connotation on it, but it's applicable definitely uh, to our walks with Jesus. Not every hill is worth dying on. We should not be so consumed by the things of this world that we forget that our minds and our hearts 
And our motives and our mission should be focused on the kingdom of God. The morals that we live by should be based upon God's holy word. The issues that, that Paul was addressing here with the Romans, uh, they were dealing with things like what they would eat or drink. Remember, the, 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 there were certain Jews who were concerned with restrictive diets. They thought they should be vegetarians. We know there was something wrong with them. Uh, sorry for all the vegetarians here. I don't think I have a single one. Um, or if some days were more special than the others, that's the thing they were talking about. And we look at that, those things and say, wow, that's not signif- that shouldn't be significant enough uh, for division. And I mentioned this last week. Uh, we look at that as seem, be, seeming kind of petty. But Paul was not just talking to the Roman church. The, the Holy Spirit did not impress upon Paul uh, to say these things, and these things to be written down and memorialized for the sake of the Romans way back when. The Holy Spirit put this here for a reason. The reason is that there are conflicts within the church. And I'm not talking about the whole church as a body of Christ. Let me get real specific. Uh, There are times when there are problems here at Grace Free Baptist Church. And when they arise, if they arise, if they're here now, if there are those hurt feelings that cause people to get fired up or maybe even avoid each other, you want to know one right now? I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm going, to, I'm going to get real with you right now. One of the problems I have right now, standing in Lowe's yesterday, Noella and Judy came up, talked to me and Crystal. Jerry just walked right on by. Jerry, I cried myself to sleep last night. I'm just kidding. I did, I did tear up a little bit, but I fought it. Uh, there are going to be disagreements which rise up. There are things that hurt feelings. But, really, should it cause division within a church? No. Why? Because most of those things will never matter in eternity. We're not going to be sitting in heaven. I'm not going to look at Jerry in heaven and say, you remember that one time at Lowe's you just walked on right by me? I know you saw me. Look, talking about you this morning, let me clear the air. I'm not. I'm going to be a little selfish just for a minute. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a more serious story. Maybe a little bit more serious story. Uh, let me tell you how little things don't matter in eternity, but we can make them big deals. You guys were welcoming, those who were here. I came into this church as an unbeliever, as lost as lost can possibly be. And I came in, and I stayed here a few months. Eventually, thank God, surrendered my life to the Lord And after that, I was growing and I was learning, or I thought I was growing. I was attempting to learn. And I started thinking about church membership. Why is that important? So I looked into why that was important and uh, studied a little bit more, talked to a few people. And then I thought, you know what? I I can't join Grace. I can't join Grace Free Will Baptist Church. And I'll tell you what my problem is, or was. I was like, you know what? I like John so much. I... He, I looked at him as my spiritual leader that if, if he were to go, I, I won't necessarily like the next guy who's here. Now look, I haven't been first at very many things in my life. I don't think I've ever been first in a foot race unless I've thrown one of the kids back so I can beat them, okay? In a legitimate race, I've never been first. Wasn't the first in my class. Never been the top rated employee at... My job, I wasn't even the firstborn. My parents could at least extend me that courtesy. But here was what I was first at. I was the first to complain about me being pastor because I complained about me being pastor before I ever knew I was called to be a pastor way back when, and I wouldn't join the church because I was going to be pastor. That's what I was first at, okay? Now look, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but here's the real reason I share that with you. In light of eternity, we shouldn't be worshiping any man. In 1 Corinthians, that is what Paul was addressing. Nobody should be elevated up to Christ. And no matter who's in this pulpit, or who it is, or where it is that you worship, the truth is, if the Word of God is being preached, and people are focused on worshiping God, then we are are, are to be focused on God's kingdom, and not any of these immaterial things that are worldly focused. 
Paul, he keeps reiterating these things and pointing out these little things that I sometimes think, was this really important enough to include in God's word a matter of what people ate or what they drank, who they liked to preach? But then I realized it's there because we still have some of those same uh, eternally insignificant disagreements now. And some churches split over them. Some folks leave church and never get back in. And I don't know about you guys. That doesn't make me happy. That's, that's, that's disappointing. But if we were more focused on the kingdom, maybe those, those disagreements can be worked out. We should consider our reputation as followers of Jesus Christ because we can do things that causes other to stum- others to stumble. That's why we should never have the, the thought, I don't care what other people think. We should care because our actions can affect others. At that time, when I went and joined Grace because I was worried about who might be the next person, and I was just too immature in the faith to realize it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. I was worshiping God, not, not a man. We should consider our reputation. Verse 19 tells us to conduct ourselves in, a, in such a way that breeds peace and does not cause hostility or does not make way for bitterness to arise. It calls for you and I to be in harmony with each other as followers of Jesus, to be in union with one another. Then in verse 20, the Apostle Paul encourages those who were seasoned and those who were strong in the faith to avoid having a negative influence on the weak by insisting they go against what their conscience tells them. In this case of Romans chapter 14, uh, don't fight the weak believer about what to eat or not. You know, last week the, the, the title of the message was, Who's Right? Well, this week the title of the message is, Does It Really Matter? Because what they ate or drank, we know based upon what Jesus has taught and what God's word declares. What somebody eats, whether it's meat, vegetables, bugs, it's not going to keep them out of heaven. And it's not going to send them to hell. We are called to be in union with one another and to not have negative influence upon each other. Simply to understand where they're coming from, and to honor them, those who are weak in the faith, by, by, by participating in things that we know will offend them. Why do that? Why would we ever intentionally do things that would hurt people? Now, I'm gonna, I'm a, I know I'm talking a lot about myself this morning, but I want you to understand, when I share these things, I, I do my best to practice what I preach. Years ago, there was a group of us, but I'll take credit, although I'll take credit, you can blame me. There used to be this wonderful little cross up here. Cross hung right here in this corner. It was nice. It was here the entire time since I started coming to Grace. And I don't know, there was a group that was like, we need a change. We need something different. We need to freshen things up a little bit. So we took that cross down and we brought this cross in. That upset some people. Now me, I'm like, well, what's the big deal? Immature in my faith. What is the big deal about that? I'm, why do I have to ask people's permission? I'm a part of this church too. I talk to the pastor. But the fact of the matter is, if it causes one person's worship to be hindered and I know that, I shouldn't have done it. Maybe I should have had a conversation with them first to try to understand, which I didn't do, by the way, to try to understand where they're coming from before we took that down. Little things like this should not divide each other. And then if I'm, the, if I'm on the other side of that and I see it taken down and I don't like it, I shouldn't make a big, that much of a big deal about it because what is that going to matter in light of eternity? See, it calls us to be people who strive to be the one who agrees the most. <laughs> uh, to be at peace the most. And as long as the weak believer is not living in, con- in, in a contradiction to God's word, why are we going to try to push them? Now, I'm not saying don't guide them. Don't give them wise counsel. But we definitely shouldn't belittle them about it because they don't understand or they're not there yet. 
The final thing we can draw from these words is to have regard for our fellow Christians. More especially those who are weaker in the faith. Picking back up in verse 21, God's word says this, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself and that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. To regard them, to regard those who are weak in the faith, means to consider them. I just, I just gave the example. I didn't consider those who might be offended by a change. Um, consider where they're at and consider where people are at, especially if they're weaker in the faith, in their walk with Christ. They may not have the same view as me or as you. They simply may have not had the experience yet. One of the things I know I'm terrible at doing, once again, I'm talking about myself this morning. One of the things I know I'm terrible at doing, and Crystal calls me out all the time about it, I expect my children to live as if they're adults. I expect them to behave better than I do most of the time. When they're running around, I expect them not to run. I expect them not to be loud in a store. I expect all these things from them. Now, I don't care when other kids do it. I, I couldn't care less. But for them, I just I hold them to such a standard. And Crystal will look at me sometimes and say, well, Davis is only three. Wyatt is only seven. And what am I doing? I'm not considering their physical maturity and their mental maturity on how they're supposed to be. It's not normal for a seven-year-old little boy to sit in the same place for two hours and not make a sound. It's virtually impossible to do. But I have expectations sometimes because I, I feel like it's my place to help train them to, to, to do the things that they should do. Uh, sometimes I don't consider where they're at. We do the exact same thing when it comes to spirituality. We look at people who are weaker in the faith, and I mentioned this last week, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, because there's some people who are Christians for 30 years and they never grow, they're still on milk. Just like an infant, physically speaking. We look at people who are weaker in the faith and we want them to, to perform to our expectations, and we get so frustrated, we get infuriated when they don't. They're just not there yet. They're just not to that point yet. By the way, on a related note, there is someone somewhere at some time who could look at us and say the exact same thing. I can't believe they do that. Look, look at what they do. Wow, they should know better. They should act differently. Look, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, uh, God's word says in verses 13 and 14, till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Look, uh, that's an odd choice of scripture to, 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 to insert here but let me tell you why I believe God led me to it. Genuine spiritual maturity is only possible if there is unity. Just like Kobe and Shaq, they could have did so much. Think of the things they could have accomplished, how many more championships they could have won if they could have got over their egos for five seconds and actually played. Was more focused on the team they were fighting against instead of fighting in fighting within themselves. Real, genuine, the most spiritual maturity happens when the body is in unity and when they have knowledge of Jesus and they are reaching you and I as individuals, when we're reaching for our fullest potential in Christ. Once again, being more focused on God's kingdom than we are of the things of this world. And we definitely, and, and by the way, you and I can't allow ourselves to be deceived. We're supposed to be hard-nosed about this. We're supposed to be legalist, a legalist about this. We can't allow ourselves to be deceived. And we definitely deceive ourselves when we disregard others 
and think that it doesn't matter how others feel about us or have little concern of how we impact those who are weaker in the faith. That is a deception. That's the ultimate deception. That creates confusion. And who is the author of confusion? There are many things that the followers of Jesus Christ disagree on. Many things. They are not necessarily the same topics that these Christians here in the book of Romans were disagreeing on. But we disagree on plenty. We may disagree on what's the best music to play for worship. We may disagree on how each, others, or how each other should dress. Uh, we may disagree on which translation of God's word is the most accurate and the best to study from. But chapter 14 gives us insight as to how such matters should be addressed. Those who are strong in the faith should control the liberty afforded to them by simply, um, by simply uh, taking into consideration by, 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 for, if for the sake of the weak, <laughs> by considering where they're at. And is it really the hill to die on with this person who's weak in the faith? Because if you have a negative influence on, him, on them, uh, him, her, whomever, then really was that song that you didn't like played in worship, was it, was it worth fighting over? Dr. Piccarelli wrote this. He said, true Christianity stands not on one's uh, own rights, but on one's responsibilities to others. Whatever limitations we impose on ourselves for the sake of our testimony, of our influence with others, and of our desire to help others are marks of the mature Christian. Look, this week, even right now, maybe, you're going to disagree with someone. And odds are someone's going to disagree with you. Maybe right now you're harboring some feelings or there might be some, some thoughts of anger or feelings of frustration uh, because of an ongoing conflict. But consider these verses and ask yourself, does it matter who is quote-unquote right in terms of eternity. I'm of the opinion that none of these things will matter when we are in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that's where all of us should be focused ourselves and pointing others to. Isn't it worth settling in your heart and with others whatever disagreements that are in place and whatever, whatever potential disagreements that's reached arguments isn't it worth settling that so that Jesus can be glorified? I don't know. Is it? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the attention of your people. I'm thankful for the challenge from your word. Father, I'm thankful for those who apply your word and don't just look at it as just a, a good story. But consider it guidelines for living. Father, I pray this morning that all of us uh, have a desire to have a good reputation. Not because we want to look good, not because we're necessarily worried about us being exalted, Father, but that, that we can be a living testimony so that you are exalted, that you are praised, that you are glorified. Father, I pray that all of us will cry out to you this morning, that we'll pray uh, that you give us this burden to live in a way that looks honorable to you first, or that is honorable to you first, and then to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and also to the unbeliever. Father, I also want to lift up this morning those who may have disagreements here in the church. Father, for those who are here that may have disagreements with people outside of the church. Father, I pray that all of us, will lay those down, cast away those hurt feelings and those, healing, or those feelings of anger. And Father, that we seek reconciliation. That we regard those who may be weaker in the faith or that are, or have no faith at all. I pray that we do that so that we can grow and that we can move past whatever it is that hinders us. Father, I know at times when we think we're right, there's sometimes no convincing us. 
But we're definitely not right if we say that any disagreements here on earth is worth us missing heaven or causing someone else to stumble their way out of your will. Father, I just pray you convict every heart in this house. And Father, I pray if there be anyone in here this morning who does not know you, that something that was said, something that was sung, Father, just the Spirit being present in this house moves upon them that you call out to them and they respond by faith and surrender their life to the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name I pray these things. Amen.